I would like to, um, to first introduce uh, Rangjun Yeshe Institute. You might not know about it. So um, Rangjun Ye in, uh, Yeshe Institute is a center for Buddhist studies based in uh, Nepal, um, in Bodhanath, Nepal. And the kind of strong feature of the Center for Buddhist Studies is that uh, we um, bring together traditional teachings in the very traditional Tibetan teachings uh, of the Buddha with contemporary approaches. So we do use experiential learning a little bit like we will experience today through uh, visual um, photography, uh, contemplative photography, but we also use uh, academic work. So really the analysis of, of text and learning the languages. So that's another uh, strong feature of Kangjung Yeshe Institute is that we teach uh, Tibetan, Sanskrit. There are some courses on, in Pali and in Chinese. So we're trying to bring in the major languages of the teachings of the Buddha and uh, train people to do to be translators amongst uh, other things. Um, so this is on Jung Yeshe Institute and this guest lecture series is uh, this year part of my Buddhist art course. Um, um, and the idea here is really to put into practice the teachings that we're uh, uh, receiving uh, mostly through textual studies. Um, so this series of guest lecture, the theme is basically contemplative arts this year, and it will lead to a conference in uh, April 28th, uh, 29th and 30th, and with a panel, undergraduate panel, in on the 1st of May. So if you're interested, you'll find the call for paper uh, in the chat box. Um, next week, we will have a movement, contemplative movement practice. But today, we are very happy, um, delightful, delighted really, to receive Andy Carr, who's been a long time practitioner has met some of the greatest teacher in the very early days, as I just learned now, uh, 1971, you said, right, Andy? <laughs> so uh, really early on catching the brilliance of the Tibetan teacher and really being struck and probably very transformed by, it, uh, by these meetings. So he studied with great uh, masters, but he's also published um, books. He is the author of Contemplative Reality, an Experiential Guide to Buddhist Philosophy, um, published in 2007. He's also co-authored The Practice of Contemplative Photography, Seeing the World with Fresh Eyes, a wonderful book that is still in my reference shelf uh, today. And his latest book will come in May 20, 2023. So uh, please um, keep an eye for it. It's called Into the Mirror, A Buddhist Journey Through Mind, Matter, and the Nature of Reality. So please welcome uh, our guest today, Andy Carr. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Diane. And um, thank you all for attending this talk. I'm Really happy to be here with you virtually. Uh, and um, I'm happy to have a chance to talk about the Dharma. So to begin with, imagine that you are walking in a garden. It's not light, maybe it's the end of the day or the very beginning of the day, and you happen to see a striped rope, and you mistake it to be a snake. This is a very classical 
Buddhist image uh, called a rope snake. And of course, uh, most of us, when we see snakes, get frightened. Uh, some of us might be really excited and really happy to see a snake. But in any event, uh, we will have some experience uh, connected with this snake, even though there's no snake there. Another um, thing you might imagine is that you are walking in a desert and you don't have any water. And you walk and you walk and you're thirstier and thirstier. And all of a sudden you see on the horizon this shimmering light that looks like water and you think, oh, it's an oasis. I can get water. And um, that's what's known as a mirage. So there are lots of images like this, the classical images of rope snakes and mirages and magicians, illusions and um, dreams. All of these are images of things that appear to be one thing, but are actually something else. A more contemporary uh, image for this might be a movie or a television show where it seems like you're watching real people uh, doing real things in a real environment, but actually it's just light on the screen. And in fact, at the moment, you probably are imagining you are watching some teacher in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but actually you're probably just looking at a computer screen and seeing light coming off of that screen. So all of these are examples of things that appear one way, but are actually something else. And our whole world is like that. All the hopes and fears we experience come from the snakes and mirages, oasises that we take to be real. Things are appearing to us and we, <clears throat> excuse me, are mistaken about their nature. And that sets off chain reactions. First moment, some image appears or some sound or whatever some direct sensory experience occurs. And in the next moment, we misidentify. We don't recognize its nature. And we think it's something to seek or to avoid, something to hope for or to fear. And, you know, that sounds like a big deal, like we're going to have some terrible thing or some wonderful thing, but it could be as simple as you have the image of a grilled cheese sandwich that you'd like for lunch. And you think, wow, that would be really satisfying. And what starts as a simple mental image launches a chain reaction of hope and fear. Hope that the sandwich is going to be really tasty and that you have everything you need to make it and fear that you might not have bought enough cheese to make a whole sandwich. Equally, it can be some gigantic thing. Hope that a new job that you imagine, a new career, 
a new house, a new partner would provide that wonderful satisfaction that you see. Fear that you're going to get old, sick, die. All of these start out as a simple experience, something very direct, either a sensory experience or a mental experience, and then a chain reaction happens based on that. So the way this works, or the way this is explained to work in the Buddhist theories of perception is that um, we have these two types of objects that appear to our minds. One type of object is these simple sensory or mental experiences which we could call uh, using the kind of contemporary Western terminology particulars, just an instance of um, direct experience. And then in the second moment, a second type of object appears to the mind, which we could call a generality or a concept. This might be followed by a name. So these two different types of objects appear to the mind and we take them to be one thing. We think that the snake actually is in the rope, that there's actual water in the oasis in the mirage. So that's a mistake. That's a mistaken way of experiencing the world. Kempo Sultram Gyamso, one of my teachers said that samsara is making a mistake. And nirvana is when you stop making it. So this whole mistaken way of experiencing our worlds is very fundamental and very subtle and hard to recognize. To give you a um, more hopefully tangible experience of what I'm talking about, let's do a little exercise. So think of something that you really like to have. Take a few moments to just bring to mind something you'd really like. So that's a generality. It's not a detailed, specific sensory experience. It's probably not a detailed, specific mental experience, but something's appearing to your mind in a general way, encompassing all the aspects of that thing that you would like. So there's a technical term that they use in the Buddhist theory of perception called a generally characterized phenomenon. Um, I think the contemporary term generality is a little easier on the tongue. So I'm gonna stick with that, but we're talking about a, a technical term here. So, Generalities appear in a vague way. They're not precise and detailed. 
Next, look at something within your visual field. Maybe it's a little light on your computer or something in the room around you or even the screen of the computer. That's a particular, that moment of perception, the visual perception appears in a detailed way, in a complete way. The whole thing is appearing at one time. I think you will notice that it's very different from the generality. So the technical term for this in the Buddhist theory of perception is specifically characterized phenomena, phenomena that appear in very specific ways. So we have these two different kinds of objects that appear to the mind. We have particulars, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, thoughts. All of these appear in very particular detailed ways. And then we have generalities, these um, rather vague forms that encompass all of the instances of all the particulars related to that concept. Maybe it'd be helpful to think of something that's a little abstract like a cow. So a cow could be white with black spots or brown or big or small or whatever. But when you think about cows, it's the abstract generality that comes to mind. When you see a cow, you have particulars. You see visual forms. You might smell the cow if you're close enough. You might hear it if it's mooing. Each one of those moments of experience is a particular. And the way our minds work is we blend those together. We think that that visible form is a cow. It's actually that general thing. And we're doing this all the time. So in the examples of the illusions that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, you see the striped rope, that's a particular, it's a little vague, it's not completely obvious what it is. And the generality snake arises in your mind. And along with that generality comes probably fear. You see the mirage. And again, it's a visual form that's not really clear. It's not obvious what it is. And the generality of an oasis comes to mind. And you blend those two. They, they are somehow combined together as though there really is a snake in that rope, or there really is a, an oasis in that mirage. So these are kind of um, far-fetched examples, but they're, they're useful for bringing out the, the basic notion here. Much more um, common, I think, is what happens all the time when we see people. In the first moment, there's just visible form. It's a particular. It doesn't have a name from its own side. It doesn't have any other characteristics. It's just visual. But in the second moment, that becomes our friend or our enemy or 
a neutral or someone that we would like to meet or someone we rather not like to meet. All of those things appear to our minds. They don't come from the side of the visual form, the particular. They're all generalities that get blended with this particular. So so-and-so becomes a nice person. Someone else appears to be a jerk. And that seems to be really part of the experience you're having of other. And we don't differentiate what's appearing to our senses in a direct way from what's appearing to our minds in a general way. And we're confused about it. So if someone seems to be an enemy, we react in a certain way. And of course, that reaction will condition the relationship with that person. Likewise, if we think of someone as a friend or attractive or whatever, and we want to go toward them, that will condition our relationship with them. And in each of these cases, it might be fine, but we are under a compulsion. We are compelled by our projections, our concepts. We are continually driven by these concepts, these projections. And in fact, our whole live experience is driven by these concepts. So that's what it means to say that samsara is making a mistake. We mistake what we experience directly, the particulars of our experience for generalities and then react to them. And that reaction is called karma. It's action that is conditioned by our mistaken perception. So that's kind of the background view that brings us to contemplative practice. Because the whole point of Buddhism is to reveal what is hidden from us normally, reveal the mistakenness that we experience and free us from these chain reactions. So one of the best ways to do this, obviously, is the sitting practice of meditation, shamatha vipassana. That's a way that we are exposed to what's going on in our minds all the time and is usually completely overlooked. But most of us are not gonna spend all our waking hours in sitting meditation. So we need practices that we can use when we're off the cushion to point out the same kind of thing. And the practices of Dharma art are excellent ways of showing us how our minds are functioning. My own experience is mainly with contemplative photography. And the way that practice works is you have the view that you want to recognize those direct visual particulars, those direct moments 
of sensory experience before they become overlaid with concepts. So to do this practice, it's really important to give up the ambition to make great photographs, to find great subjects for your photographs, and to look very simply at the ordinary aspects of your world, because it's in those ordinary experiences that you might glimpse a direct moment of visual perception. And then you learn to let go of those second thoughts or those second moments where there's some concept about, oh, I saw something really cool. I'm gonna make a photo of that. So you learn to drop that, to let go of it and just go back to making an image of what you've seen. So very simply, the basis of this practice is learning to distinguish particulars from generalities. Distinguish your moments of visual perception from whatever it is you think about what you've seen. And then to be able to make an image that expresses that moment so that someone else looking at that image might have the same fresh experience that you had. It's a way of um, being able to communicate through art the freshness that's possible when we distinguish our direct sensory experience from our imaginations about what it is. So I feel like I've talked for quite a bit, probably more than enough, I hope I haven't confused you too much. I thought that rather than uh, go on further, it would be better to show you some images that are examples of, it, of things that I've shot that I think uh, communicate probably more than the words about what these direct experiences are like. Hopefully I can remember how to share my screen with you and play this slideshow. And it, it's gonna last about eight minutes. And after the slideshow, we'll have a chance for a discussion. So here goes, hopefully.
So there you go. Thank you, thank you so much, Andy. Um, is it is it a good time to start the question and answer period? Yes, perfect. It's it's always hard to start talking about contemplating after contemplating uh, beautiful images like this. Um, thank you. There is a first question. You can write your question. In, um, I'm talking to everyone right now. Uh, write your question or lift your hand. There is already one from Eduardo and then we have one from Pallavi. So, um, Eduardo, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Andy, for such wonderful pictures. Uh, they were very pleasant to my sight to process in my mind. So I was thinking about that when trying to capture or looking for the perfect spot. Would you agree that the mind would tend to attach to what sees as desirable or pleasurable and uh, obviously or probably tend to reject unpleasant objects or or spaces and would remain indifferent to what do, what do you think thanks yeah well thank you um yes that is the projection that we have that rather than seeing images or whatever it is as just neutral and um, fresh and vivid, we overlay them immediately with desirable, undesirable, threatening, helpful. Um, we, we superimpose these generalities and then we react to that. So if something seems desirable, we want to grasp it, cling to it. If something seems uh, threatening, we want to push it away. Um, so that's the chain reaction. There's that moment of freshness where it's just the direct experience. And then the next moment there's some projection onto that experience, some projection about its value, or whatever, and then we start reacting. Yeah, it seems there is something to be said about the basic teachings of the three poisons in here to make connection with texts and um, studies, Buddhist studies, the real sense of um, how contemplative photography highlights the process of the three poisons. Right, it's it's quite amazing how it does that. Yeah, yes, agree. So there yes, is. I, I I was thinking about, for example, sometimes you see like in journalism, like very powerful photography, like let's say the Holocaust, uh, Nazi Germany. Those images are very vivid very capturing the pain, uh, the, the unpleasant. So I was thinking about sometimes those pictures for me are hard to process while others are beautiful, desirable, graspable. I was thinking about that. So thank you. Um, um, Pallavi, would you ask your question? Hi, Andy. Thank you for doing this. And I, I was always very curious and inquisitive about contemplative photography. And, but somehow never got a chance to dig into it. And I'm like so really grateful for Rangjung Yeshe and you for kind of coming together and presenting this. It just gives me some insight into what exactly it is. So um, if you can just help me uh, with 
just taking any of the images, they were like really interesting, powerful images, a mix of different ones, like lines and shapes and nature. Uh, when you saw a particular image, like what's the process like when you see like what occurs to you to take that photo and once you take, take that picture and when you look at it, uh, what is it that you feel like when you see it? Is it a change or is it like, like I just want to understand the process, like how is it before and after? Yeah. Yeah, so good question. Um, I think the, um, the experience before taking the picture is that you have a moment of fresh perception. You have a moment of, oh, you're not sure of what you're seeing. It's just vision. It's like you were asleep and your eyes suddenly opened and you have that moment of freshness of um, almost being overwhelmed by something that you can't describe. Then, of course, the next moment is, I'm gonna take a picture of this. <laughs> so you need to let, not get sucked into some big discursive thing about taking the picture and how good it'll be or how bad or whatever, and you'll win the prize for, you know, all of those things arise in our minds naturally. That's the way our minds work. So you go back to the visual experience. You let go of whatever discursive processes unfolding, go back to the experience and look further. Just look at what it is. If it's some pine needles on a path, you just look and you see what that first moment, that fresh moment of experience included. And then very simply, you just pick up your phone or your camera and you make an image of just what you saw in that first moment. Not trying to make it better, not trying to apply some photographic techniques, just faithfully forming the equivalent of what you saw. And then afterwards, you might look at the image and you might feel again that freshness. Or you might look at it and say, ah, that doesn't quite represent what I saw. I missed it. I had an experience a few months ago where I, I was walking outside and I saw this very big tree stump that had been cut off and there were a bunch of white coat hangers on it. And they, they were kind of laying scattered about in some no obvious pattern, but there was something about the whole scene, the textures of the wood from the stump, the whiteness and the lines of the coat hangers. And it struck me that way. It was like one of those, it stopped me. It was a visual experience that um, I really liked. And then I made an image of it. And then each time I look at that image, I'm disappointed because it doesn't, I cropped it a little too close. I didn't include the whole thing that I had seen. And so it doesn't quite communicate what my experience was. So is it the, the difference between the usual photography that we do and contemplative is the curiosity plus of course, no after effects of much cropping or effects. What is the key factor between, like I, between contemplative photography and the usual photography? Usually we're trying to take a picture of things. Usually we wanna take a picture of our friends or something beautiful or a sunset or whatever. We don't usually just take pictures of our visual experience. 
they get mixed with our generalities. So you have that moment of fresh experience, then you have a projection about it, and then you try to take a picture of a projection. And of course, our phones and our cameras will not show the projection, they'll just show the visual form. So it's very hard to actually um, make a good image when you're trying to shoot something that isn't visual. So if you're taking a picture of your friend and all you care about is making a nice picture of your friend, it's hard to notice the details of their facial expression because you already see, oh, it's my friend, they're happy, they're having fun. But the actual moment of making the image has to be about the visual quality itself, just the particular, because that's all you're gonna show in the image. And so, Contemplative photography is a great tool for distinguishing when you're actually seeing and when you're thinking, when you're perceiving and when you're conceiving, because the camera only will show the perception. It won't show what you think about it. It won't show the generality. It won't show the projection. It'll just show the image, which is why so many of our snapshots look pretty crappy because we weren't actually looking when we made the image, we were thinking. So there's a nice quote from Henri Cartier-Bresson about that, which I think I should read to you. By the way, Henri Cartier-Bresson, the great French photographer who died a few years ago, is one of my heroes. And um, one of the few great photographers who was very articulate about photography, who could talk about it in, in very clear and vivid ways. So he said, thinking should be done before and after, not during photographing. Success depends on the extent of one's general culture, one's set of values, one's clarity of mind, one's vivacity. The thing to be feared most is the artificially contrived, the contrary to life. Which I would say is um, exactly the, um, the sense of contemplative photography. Very powerful quote there very dharmic in many ways, <laughs> so much so. Um, if you have any recommendation about um, what to read from him, it would be welcome. Well, there's uh, only one book, I think, that, that has a lot of what he wrote. It's called um, A la Sauvette, I think, in French, but um, The Decisive Moment in English. <laughs> so great. I mean, there is many, many uh, things to be said about the teachings on impermanence and that fresh seeing, right? It's right there and then, a la sauvette, decisive, right? It's very interesting. Um, there are a few questions coming in, um, some related. So if it feels like you need to... Um, repeat i think repetition is, may not be a problem but it, it's it's kind of a kind of a different angle um and this is coming from ali catherine um when uh does the visual object become a concept well the visual object never becomes a concept but what happens is the first moment there's the visual perception and in the second moment, superimposed on that is the thought, the conception. 
the projection. So it's almost like you're putting a filter over your visual experience. And um, you see the visual experience through this cloudy filter of a generality. Yes, Ali Catherine. Uh, thanks, Sarsley. The sun is just kind of went up where I live. <laughs> it's early. Uh, right, I asked the question about when does something visual become a concept? And uh, the thing that I want to offer is, so I'm a painter, I'm not a photographer. And so when I start to paint, <laughs> If I want to see something, I have to stay with I want to see to be able to get something to resolve because whatever I make has to evolve over time because I'm painting and I'm constructing a series of whatever it is. So I've got to hold on to uh, I want to see and I have to rest in it and I have to build a sense of repose with I want to see and then um, so I wanted to say that. So that's that's how I go into taking pictures is I want to see. And what I tell myself is to aim for the temporariness. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, what's that? And it's a great instruction to give myself because I don't really know what it is, but that combination and what I mean by temporariness is um, I, I don't think about the concepts. I mean, literally things like what is the temporariness that I see like I'm at sunrise right now so these are a whole bunch of fleeting moments and people who paint uh, often know that um, there's a set of painting images especially in uh, Japanese ukiyo-e which is a uh, uh, art for the temporary which is people who vacation um, so that temporariness, there's a set of qualities that go into constructing an image that has temporariness. And <laughs> yeah, as a painter, I'm just humbled. I'm like, oh my God, you all get a camera. Yay. <laughs> and I get to want to see. <laughs> okay, so that's my comment. And I still want more about when does it go from temp you know, temporariness or wanting to see in to a concept. Thank yeah, you. So, so that's great. That's a very helpful comment. Um, generalities are permanent. Particulars are momentary. So it happens so quickly. You have one moment of visual perception and the next moment, the concept is there. So when I was training in contemplative photography with Michael Wood, who was my mentor and uh, teacher, he often talked about the Impressionists and particular Monet and the uh, way that they started to paint with very big strokes and very quickly and trying to form the equivalent of fleeting perceptions, direct experiences, that this was uh, similar in his mind to the contemplative photography approach. That um, if you've seen Monet's uh, haystacks or um, Rouen Cathedral or any of the things he painted many times. He would paint the same subject in different light, different weather, different time of day. And um, each time it was to capture that moment of that experience rather than trying to make some statement about haystacks altogether the generality of haystacks. So the, I think that's another good example of um, this kind of contemplative process of art making. 
Thank you, thank you. So we have uh, four now, perhaps even five uh, questions. So Eric first, then we have Mary, then Suptik, then Elisaveta. So um, Eric, would you like to ask your question first? Hi, thank you, Andy. Um, I think my question might have kind of been answered. Um, I was kind of just saying, when does the moment of choice occur? Because there is choice in a photograph, I suppose. And when I think about choice, there's something of kind of interpretation or concept or generality, of you, as you said. So, but I think what, yeah, I think the last part of my question is that, is it more automatic? like an automatic choice? I, th I think the choice comes in that maybe third moment when rather than going with the conception, you choose to go back to the perception. So there's that first moment of sudden experience, very direct, followed by some second moment of identifying it or projecting onto it. And then there's the moment of choice where you go, you let go. You let go of the projection, you recognize the projection, you recognize it for what it is and drop it. And then that allows the visual or the direct experience to reemerge and then you work with that. So I think that's the moment of choice. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah, this is really, really interesting because you almost in these three steps, you almost kind of um, can appreciate the conceptual aspect coming in so that you have time to let go of it and come back. Yes. That, yeah, if you don't notice it, you get lost in a chain of conceptions, chain of thinking about it. Yeah, could you, I know this is intrusive. I'm so sorry, Dion. I'm so sorry. You know, say it again, Andy, that thing that you said, you said you go from the conception and then you go back to the perception and then go there. And because this is Dion's meeting, say something about awareness if you can. Thank you. Well, the whole process happens in awareness. So all of these things are appearing to our minds, which means that they are appearing within awareness. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Mary, would you like to ask your question? Hi, this is Marie. I didn't really have a question. It was more of a compliment and wanted to just confirm my understanding that it is, it sounds like everything is totally slowed down and you take it for what it is. And then maybe the reviewing of the photos later is where you would well this is the tricky part I guess you would identify it for its purity or maybe like you said you just missed it um but I'm so glad I attended this is beautiful a friend sent it to me and um this is wonderful thank you um but I did that was really my comment more than a question but I love your feedback well, thank you. Um, that's very kind of you. Um, yes, you slow everything down. Every You start to pay more attention to how things appear in your mind. And the um, process after you've made the images is, is basically an editorial process. You make a judgment about whether that image ac accurately 
represents the experience, whether it, it communicates still or whether you missed it. And um, editing is important. It's a whole other topic, so I'm not going to go into it, but um, you might feel like uh, you shouldn't edit things, you shouldn't adjust things, uh, that it's only about that first photograph. But uh, this is not a religion, this is a practice. So it's perfectly okay to crop your images if you didn't quite frame it the way you saw it. Um, it's okay to edit and show the things that you think really communicate what you're seeing. So um, that's those are points that often get missed. Thank you. Thank you. It, it reminds me of the whole discussion over um, volition in some way, right? There is a sense in this that um, if we let the eye into its habitual pattern, it will aim towards what is pleasant, try to avoid what is unpleasant. But here there is kind of widening of let go of the volition in some way, and yet maybe orienting the volition in, in very specific ways. What do you think of that? Well, I, I don't really think of it as volition as much as whether you're going to get captured by your projections or not. So I think that's what seems like volition is, um, is more like training to not get caught by your projections learning to, that you can let go of them. You don't have to be compelled by these things that are appearing to you. And normally the chain reactions just have a mind of their own. <laughs> they just um, take off and keep going. So to slow down and to watch how they unfold, recognize them, not get um, compelled by them is basically it's called self-liberation. The projections can self-liberate because you've seen that it's not actually part of the experience or part of the, the perception, it's something else. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now we have Suptik. Hi, Suptik. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Yes, thank you so much for this talk. So uh, the day since I heard about this phrase contemplative uh, photography, I was quite curious as to what it might mean. So I did my, my little bit of research on Google, through Google, uh, whatsoever. So I have a dilemma and my question stems from the dilemma. So um, documentary style photographer for the most part. And one of the dilemmas that I've always faced through an example, let me try to explain that let's say uh, there is a clash happening between let's say the students and the police. So as a photographer, if I'm within, the, if I'm standing among the police, what I capture, what it seems like that maybe the students are, are attacking the police. On the other hand, if I'm standing among the students, it appears that the police is, is attacking the students, right? So um, I would really like to um, look at contemplation from two perspectives. One is uh, contemplating while clicking the photograph and the other is contemplation for my audience or rather for my viewers who, are, who was not there in the scene, who doesn't, who is not aware of the reality because being a documentary photographer, it feels like there is a, a sense of responsibility towards capturing the reality within quotes reality, so to speak. So how do you uh, look at this um, uh, different perceptions and contemplations of the, of, of the photograph itself and the varied and sometimes conflicting, sometimes misleading um, um, uh, what comes out of the photography? of the photograph for that matter. So how do you look at 
this varied narratives that come out. Thank you. That's a wonderful example. I love the way you described the two perspectives on the conflict. And I think to me, what that says is that um, there is no one truth. There is no one version of reality that will communicate everything. You can't really um, choose sides ultimately. I think as a documentary photographer, you have a slightly different ambition than as a contemplative photographer. So the practice of contemplative photography can be very helpful to train you to see. But then what you do with that seeing and the kinds of photographs you make might have a different agenda. And that's fine. So the contemplative photography is about training to see, training to let go of superimposition, emphasizing freshness. And the best contemporary photography, contem sorry, the best um, documentary photographers can see really well. But they also have other responsibilities and that's beyond the scope of the um, contemplative practice at this point. Do you wanna say some more? Because I, I really like where you're taking this. I'm just not uh, sure I know how to address it very well. Right, uh, so yeah, I mean, You're muted. You're muted. Am I audible now? Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So, um, in line with what the conversation is uh, has been happening. So, as a photographer, um, there are uh, certain. Let's say, as a photographer, I have my own personal experiences and my own contemplation of the reality around me. Again, reality within double quotes, where I'm trying to perceive and I'm trying to capture. But where I'm really curious in understanding is um, my experience, how can I translate that to the experience of my viewer when it comes to define, giving meaning or in the process of curation, so to speak. So can a photograph in itself hold enough to be its own self? Well, I think, I think it can, but it will, it will not have any narration. So particulars, moments of direct experience have no storyline. You can have a good narrative, you could construct a narrative with a bunch of pictures or a bunch of words. And those narratives could be very valuable and uh, evocative for people. But an image by, by itself, a moment of visual perception is um, free of any of the things we might want to project on it. That's the point of the contemplative approach. And the, the point of doing this practice all together is to help us recognize how mind works and free us from the compulsion of the chain reactions that make up samsara. It's a different project than the project of uh, documenting or uh, creating a narrative. This is to break down all narratives. 
So yeah. if I understand you correctly, um, are you suggesting detaching of, as a photographer, detaching myself with the subject, with the reality around me and just trying to capture through the lens of, as you put it, the generality, um, so to speak? Um, you know, this is a practice. This is a contemplative practice. And the point is not the photographs we make. The point is the experience we have when we're doing the practice and using the photographs to share with others the possibility of this kind of fresh, uncontrived experience. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. There are two more questions and many comments um, after that. Um, let's see. Uh, Elzevita, would you like to ask your question? She doesn't have a mic, Dan. Oh. Doesn't have a a mic. Okay, so I will ask your question. Um, here it is. Uh, dear Andy, thank you very much uh, for showing your photographs. I wanted to ask, do you see an artwork as something that has its own essence, almost like trying to bring to life another human with its own personality? Or for you, it's rather a flow of experience without separation between works. Hmm. I'm not sure I know how to address that question. I think, you know, one thing about art is that we do tend to get very fixated about the, um, products of our art. And I notice in particular, I have a few of the photographs I've taken and really liked around my house. And I notice I will go for weeks at a time without noticing any of them. And then I'll notice one and I'll go, oh, that's nice or whatever. So, you know, taking our art, our products as somehow very special is, um, it's not really necessary. Especially with these contemplative arts where the point is so much about working with our minds and not with producing products that will last through the ages. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I guess that's the best I can do right now. Hey, uh, Dion, can I jump in? You're muted, Dion. Yes, go ahead, you're next, but be short. Thank you. So it turns out I wrote my uh, thesis on this. I have an MFA in both painting and design, and I wrote this thing on does an object uh, create visual intelligence. And, and so what I did is I went to museums and I stood next to paintings like a Rembrandt or there's a Van Gogh in New York City, uh, this starry night. <laughs> and I would try to see what people's perceptual response was. And I'm like, oh, so it turns out just, you know, my small survey, the, ob the object did contain some type of visual intelligence in them and to talk about what makes visual intelligence in the associative field that's another conversation uh so then the question is can well so i'm a painter so can um a fleeting moment have elements of creating capacity or spaciousness within that read within the visual read and the amount of time we're talking about is um, when people go to museums, they look at an image for about two seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
that was my response. So I think objects can have evidence of, of the things necessary to build a fresh read for the perceiver. I, I agree that they can, but you notice that the people in a museum spend a couple of seconds looking at the image and then read the um, panel next to it for about a minute. So they're looking for some generalities to overlay the particulars of the experience that they've just had. Cool. So we're coming to the end. Um, these are all wonderful. I think the, the questions and answer period was very rich, a lot to think about. Um, and um, I really appreciate your coming to this lecture series. And this is very enlightening, we could say, <laughs> um, and uh, making sense of a lot of the things that we're studying here at Rangjun Yeshe. So thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure. We wish you the best. I'm looking forward to read your next book. I encourage uh, anybody who is interested in reading more about what Andy's uh, insight are uh, based on the teachings of the Buddha. Um, so good luck with that. And for next week, we will have Arona Ayashi on movement, so contemplative movement practice, but here she's going to talk about uh, social presenting um, a theater. So the way in many ways, uh, our tactile sensation, our presence into the world um, can be a way of uh, bringing more awareness and fresh seeing uh, into our lives. So would you like um, Andy to, uh, to kind of close in with a few notes? I think I've said more than enough. All right. So there are a few comments. Um, Palavi is saying, thank you so much, Andy. Very insightful. Uh, Shriti, student in my art class. This has left me with food for thought. Thank you so much. Beautiful session. Thank you, Andy, and so on. So many thank yous. Well, maybe I'd better thank someone too, which is, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Diane, for inviting me to do this. And I would like to thank Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche and Kempo Sultram Gyamso Rinpoche, whose teachings I have um, poorly represented to you today. So um, those, those guys are the real source of what we've been talking about. And, um, fantastic teachers who have um, very uh, extraordinary ways of communicating with us. <laughs>